Father, we thank you that although it is a mystery, it has been revealed to us without question. Great is the mystery of our faith. God was manifest in the flesh. And the wonder of that, we pray that in the midst of all of the busyness of this season, will uh, grab us and hold us deeply. Thank you for the grace that is in our Lord Jesus that we'll think about tonight. So be with us to that end. In Christ's name, amen. So tonight we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 once again, and we have a, an interesting little passage. We're only going to look at a few verses tonight. And um, it's part of this larger section that Paul uh, has in chapters 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians. And we talked last week about the collection that he was wanting to raise from the Gentile or the missionary churches, I guess would be the better way to say it, especially in Greece and Macedonia, although those in uh, Turkey also get involved in it, but to be involved in sending money because the believers in Jerusalem were going through a serious time of need and difficulty. And so he's going to give it, it I, what I want you to think, because we don't uh, often think in this way, I want you to think of how important this is to Paul. He interrupts the planting, church planting ministry that he's been going on. He's made three missionary journeys, planted churches in all of these places. There's lots of reasons to go back and do them. And he breaks off all of that so he can be part of a group that is taking money back to Jerusalem to meet the needs of the believers in Jerusalem. Virtually none of the people to whom he's ministering have ever been to Jerusalem, have any interest in Jerusalem. A good number of them are Gentiles. And yet for Paul, this is worth interrupting his church planting ministry for and devoting this serious part of his life. And as it turns out, it isn't just a trip he makes because he goes to Jerusalem and he's arrested in Jerusalem, will spend a couple of years as a prisoner in that area of the Romans and then end up going to to Rome. So this is a, a, a critically important to Paul, but it is also a critical time in his life because it shapes the future, obviously, in the plan and providence of God. And, and the huge part of it was this is going to meet a need. This is going to supply uh, resources, finances, for Christians who are struggling in Jerusalem. But out of that, there's this deeper sense that the gospel, as it were, is from the Jew first also to the Greek. There's a special place for the Jewish believers. And the great tension in the early church is in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond or free, neither male or me, male or female, all one in Christ. And he wants this to be a visible expression to the Jews in Jerusalem, the, the, the believers there, but also probably to the larger community of Jews, and also to the Gentiles that were one in Christ. So this is not a small matter for him. This is, he's really saying, this is what the body of Christ is all about. God is bringing into being this new people uh, in Christ, and it eradicates all of these old divisions. So he's proposed that to the Corinthians. They got on board. He's written instructions to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 on the first day of the week, let everyone aside of you put aside and, and so forth. And then uh, uh, it, it hasn't happened or followed through in quite the way he wants. He wants to come back to Jerusalem, uh, pardon me, he wants to come back to Corinth and visit them and then from there go on to Jerusalem from Corinth. As it happens, it won't happen quite that way because of things that will happen in Corinth. So last week we looked at the first um, seven verses in the chapter, and Paul has gone to Macedonia, and if you remember, things were troubling in Corinth. He'd sent this severe letter. Titus had carried it. He was waiting for Titus to come back. He was in Troas. There was an open door for the gospel. He just could not stand not knowing what had gone on in Corinth. That was so important. So he's gone to Macedonia. When he's up in Macedonia, he's talked to them about 
this offering for the churches. And they have got excited by the project. They jumped in. As a matter of fact, they said, Paul says, he, they begged us for the grace, the favor, the privilege of being involved in this offering. Paul had apparently not intended to include them uh, because Corinth was probably a pretty well-to-do church, although it had some poor people. It had a, a number of heavy hitters in it, and he was expecting that. The Macedonians want in, and so he has told them about it. Now, so that's what we have in the first seven verses. Let's read all first of the first 15 verses. We're going to look at uh, 8 to 15. I want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God, and grace will be a big word now in this section. Um, and, and again, there's a significant principle here because Paul wants them to know that giving, Christian giving, is grace giving. It isn't obligation giving. It is grace giving. And the idea of grace has about it the idea of generosity as well. So we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in or out of a severe test of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. It's a strange combination. Um, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty overflowed um, toward giving. But that's an evidence of the grace of God that he sees. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the grace of fellowship in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, meaning what he had started in Corinth in terms of the collection, um, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you or your love for us, as I suggested last week, I think is more likely, See to it that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. I'm going to come back because I don't think that that's well translated in the ESV. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you by his poverty might become rich. And in this matter, I gave my judgment, my opinion. This benefits you, who a year ago only, not only, pardon me, started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it as well, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness, the willingness, is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For I don't mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, Whoever gathered much had nothing left over. Whoever gathered little had no lack. Now, it's a puzzling little passage in some ways, and I want to just go through and touch some things, but there's some interesting uh, questions or at least uh, issues that arise out of it, and I haven't got my head around all of it here, so we'll think together, and you can help me think more clearly about what some of it means. But you'll notice it begins, first of all, in verses 8 and 9 by Paul emphasizing to them that the supreme example of generosity is the Lord Jesus himself. But he introduces, this is a kind of bridge. He's given the Macedonians as an example, and then he's talked about his present desires in verses 6 and 7. And notice what he does now in verse 9. I say this 
not as a command. Now, I just want to pause there because it's, it's very significant that what Paul is doing in this. He keeps saying, I am not commanding you. Uh, I'm going to give an opinion. Uh, I want you to understand this, but it's what you give voluntarily. In every way, over and over, he resists the idea that he is putting pressure upon them to give. I mean, he does give a certain kind of pressure. He will not coerce them. Coerce them. He will not command them. He does not quote the Old Testament and the tithe as a principle. You ought to be doing this because there's the Old Testament command related to it. He is protecting very clearly the nature of their generosity. Because if it isn't given freely, it isn't generosity. It is a requirement in some particular way. So he begins by saying that I say this not as a command. I'm not speaking here as an apostle in the sense that I'm giving apostolic instruction that you must do. And then he says, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. Well, I suppose the text could be translated that way, but literally it reads, oh my goodness, my. The earnestness of others and that you may prove the genuineness of your love. Now the, eager, the readiness, the eagerness, the earnestness, the willingness of others is clearly what he just said. I want, I'm not commanding you, but I wanted to talk about the earnestness of others. I wanted to give the, the Macedonians as an example. I wanted you to see how they've responded to all this. And I also want you to be able to prove the genuineness of your love. So th this needs to come from your heart. It can't come as a command. It needs to come out of your heart. I want to see, and the word prove is not that he wants them to fail, but it's I want to display, I want to show the genuineness of your love. Now, the question is your love for who? And I think it has to be your love for primarily the Lord. It may in some measure be your love for me. It may be your love for the saints and for all people. But I think it's primarily, he says, I want you to, by your giving, show your love. And you fill in the blank. But I think it's primarily your love for the Lord. And then he comes to one of the great verses in, in the uh, New Testament, one that we all know. Um, and it's, it's one of those that says it so easily, and in some ways, um, I, you hardly need to unpack it. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. And I'm not going to say anything that you haven't probably already thought of in that, but that, that really is the whole life of Jesus wrapped up in the smallest kind of package that is imaginable in the New Testament. It, in a certain way, is all there. So he begins by saying, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting that he uses the full title because he wants them just to dwell on exactly who they're talking about. And he, he knows that they know this because this is the gospel. This is the essence. You cannot know the gospel and not know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's kind of sub-term for what the gospel is all about. So in this way now, the Lord Jesus is the epitome. He's the definition. He's the supreme example of grace in the sense of generosity. So you know the generosity of our Lord Jesus. Now, there's an interesting distinction. Remember what he said about the Macedonians? They gave out of extreme poverty. Now, the Lord Jesus gives out of extreme wealth. But what he gives is the wealth in itself, and it, and he, though he was rich. And that obviously refers to all that he is as God the Son, enjoying the glory of heaven, the blessings of heaven, the worship of the angels, all of those things that are rightly and fully his. It's Philippians chapter 2. Uh, that... Um, 
let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he was by very nature God, did not think it uh, something to be held onto, grasped on his own, to be equal with God. So Philippians 2, he was in the form of God in every way. He was equal with God in every way, but he emptied himself. Well, here it's though he was rich, and he doesn't elaborate that on that, but it clearly looks at the, the eternal wealth of God the Son, enjoying all those blessings. For your sake, and we'll come back to that, for your sake he became poor. And it's, it, it's, um, this is a strong word in Greek. Um, there's a word about being poor, and there's a word that means he beggared himself. He became a be virtually a beggar. That's, that's the word that's used here. This isn't just that he became poor. He beggared himself. And notice it's his action that did it. He emptied himself. Uh, and he became what he was not in some way. He became poor. And the poverty here is not economic poverty primarily. The poverty here is, first of all, humanity, his incarnation. Secondly, it's the circumstances of his life, because he lived his life in a third world, fourth world, peasant country, um, as among the poorest of the poor, living in Galilee, not in Jerusalem, and all of those kind of things. And in the largest sense of the term, he became poor means incarnation, but it also means crucifixion that he lived on earth with nothing and ended with his clothes being taken from him, hanging on a cross as a convicted criminal. And Paul expects us to see all of those kind of things. He's already said in this, uh, in this book uh, that he became sin for us, the one who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And he's talked about the, the love of Christ, uh, that he loved and gave himself. So all of those things, and then the purpose of it is the, so that he, for your sakes he became poor, that through him you might be rich. And it's interesting that that word that's used there is that you might be rich is a completed action. It isn't something that you will someday be rich. And it looks at all of the blessings that we have in Christ now. And the generosity of Christ that took on poverty, took on incarnation, took on the cross, so that we might be rich. And ultimately we will enter into the fullness of it. But those riches are already ours. And we are already experiencing those kind of things. So clearly he's not thinking here of physical and material prosperity. He's thinking of the spiritual inheritance that is ours in Christ in, uh, in, in all of those ways. So that's the first central thing he wants us to see. And so even as we think of giving, in any context we think of giving, he wants us to keep coming back to this, that all giving as Christians needs to be in light of the generosity of Christ. And it is both motivated by that and it is modeled by him in terms of how he gave himself for us. So having said all of that, uh, well, he didn't say it in very many words. He said it very concisely. But now he comes back to the issue in, um, in Corinth, that they made a pledge to be part of the, the Jerusalem collection. They were excited and thrilled when the opportunity came. But then other things it, it, uh, got them derailed off that particular platform. And instead of uh, following through, they have had this battle. He's had to write this severe letter. Their whole relationship to Paul has gotten off. And then they've now sort of been reconciled to Paul. And now he's saying, let's complete what you started. Let's finish what you began. For your benefit, for your, the sake of your spiritual character and growth, finish what you started. So let me just walk through the statement that's made here, and uh, there's several things we should notice. He said in verse 8, I say this not as a command. Verse 10, in this matter I give my 
judgment is the way the ESV translates it. I think it's closer to the way we would say it. I give my opinion because the word primarily means my opinion, not my judgment. That sounds like a judge making a commitment. The word here is I, I express my opinion. So once again, he's pulling back. He's not giving orders. He is leaving it and putting the ball, as it were, in their court so that they will give in a, in a, in a way that's appropriate. So that your readiness in desiring it, that is, to be part of this program of collection, um, you who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. I think if I was writing it, I would have put it the other way around. You started to desire it, and then you started to do it. But it doesn't matter. It comes up the same in the wash. He said, you, you were excited by the idea, and you started, and you began. So here's his opinion um, in the next verse. So now finish doing it as well, so that your willingness in desiring it, your readiness in desired it, may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. So don't just have a start that you can look back and I can apologize. Now, Paul is going out of his way to find everything he can to be positive about these Corinthians. And he's not coming here reproaching, not directly anyway, but he's saying it would be well for you, it's good for you, um, verse 9, uh, this benefits you if you finish doing it as well so that your readiness in desiring is matched in this particular way. But it's, he then goes on to say, by completing it out of what you have. And he clarifies that in this next verse. For if the readiness is there, the willingness is the, it is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Now, both in this verse and in the next one, Paul is anticipating um, objections or excuses or rationalizations. And he's anticipating somebody's going to say, uh, I, I, this has been a bad year in business. I don't have what I normally have. And he's saying, give out of what you have, not out of what you don't have. Um, it's acceptable if you give what you're able to give, not what in some golden world you might think you can give. So, do what you can. Now, he's already talked about the Macedonians, and he said they gave according to their ability and beyond their ability. I'm not putting that on you. He's saying just give according to what you have. And then he anticipates another objection. Uh, it's interesting. Whenever the subject give, of giving gets up, there's always going to be lots of rationalizations and excuses. And this particular objection is, well, what that would mean, why should we lower our standard of living to elevate their standard of living? That, that's not the way it would go. Why, why should we take on hardship so they can have it easier? So he, he anticipates that in what he says in this next verse. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened. That comes back to give what you're able to give at this particular point. Not trying to make your life harder and their life be easier in terms of that. Um, I don't mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but as a matter of fairness. Now, I was surprised when I came back and read the, I'm sorry, I do most of my studying in my, out of my Greek text, so I was surprised when I came back and said, the ESV translates that fairness. That's a very strange translation because the word is equality. And they were maybe trying to explain it. But it, then I went and said, I wonder what other versions do. And all of the other translations that I could come across all translated it equality. So I don't know why they chose fairness. I don't like the word fairness because it reminds me of little kids saying it's not fair. Um, Paul's not talking about fairness in some strange concept of what fairness is. But I must confess here, I get a little puzzled by exactly what he's talking about, uh, or, or exactly how he puts it, but it's very challenging to me. 
I don't mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but as a matter of equality, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need so that there may be equality. So at the present time, as you give out of what you're able to give, their needs will be met because they are in danger of starvation. So you will at least raise up their needs. And there's a kind of reciprocity here because there may come a time when it works the other way. So your needs or their resources will apply to your needs. Now, it's possible, and I, this is where I haven't figured this out, and as I read the commentators, they aren't either. It also may be that so something of what Paul says in Romans when he writes about the same thing and why the Gentiles ought to give. The Gentiles ought to give to Jewish believers because they are enjoying the richness that comes through Judaism through the Old Testament and those blessings. So there may be, so he may be saying, give of your material needs so that because you're participating in their spiritual blessings that God has brought into being through the Hebrew people. And then he closes with a quotation from the Old Testament. And the quotation from the Old Testament is simply this Whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little, had no lack. Does anybody know where that comes from? Pardon? Okay, Exodus. It's the giving of manna. And it's the whole provision that here they were in the wilderness and the thing was that the manna falls and you go out and you collect the manna and the issue is that there will be enough for the next day. Don't save it up and hoard it because it's going to go rotten overnight. And uh, the one who gathers a lot won't have any more than the one who gathers comparatively little because both will have enough for that day. And they'll start again the next day. So it's an interesting picture there. There was God ordained in the giving of manna in the wilderness a kind of intriguing equality uh, in that particular way, except those who didn't go out and, and labor. And he's already talked about that in 1 Thessalonians, that if you don't work, you're not going to eat. So that's a whole other part. So I have, I have a couple of questions here. Oh, let's just step back and see. There's a couple of questions I want you to think with me about. But um, are there any observations or questions you have as you try to think this through? Some of the things that Paul is saying here. Obviously, it's very specific to a particular thing, but underneath are some principles that are useful for us to think about. Okay. Okay, Jordan. Just, just, okay. Does this support the idea of having church associations so that churches can share in, in this way? Um, whether it be for um, disasters that strike one area or um, you know, building buildings or people in need or that kind of thing? Well, I think I'd come back and say to, to, um, that may be an application. In this context, Paul, there, there's no formal association mm -hmm. with Jerusalem. Um, as a matter of fact, Jerusalem isn't part of his sphere of ministry. So if you're thinking of a Pauline organization, you wouldn't include Jerusalem in it. So I think Paul's going for bigger fish, and he's saying it's not there's an association of, of uh, churches in some organizational way. There is a spiritual unity um, that's more important than any organizational unity. Not, I'm not, in practical terms, the second may be but the remarkable thing here is that this, well, let, let me come back to this because this is a question I want to wrestle with you a little bit later. Anything else on, the, on this part of it? Well, let me, let me talk about, uh, the first question I have is, um, we're not in this, we're not 
part of it now, so it's easy to stand back a little bit. But I, I can't help but thinking about how Paul is going about raising funds and what often happens in churches, especially when you get in building programs, about how you raise funds. And, um, and I'm grateful for those who've done that, but every time I do, I get a little bit, or I've gotten, been through it several times, I get queasy about those because there are always things that you're told are gonna happen. Identify the big givers, go after the big givers, get them to give gifts. Uh, if you can get somebody who make a private visit to them, which I've never done in my life, and get them to sign a card in the presence of you because they will give more if you were there, then they will if they're just on their own. And I sit back and think, I don't think Paul would love that very much. I think he would feel pretty queasy about how do we protect, but we've got a real need. There's real money that needs, people need to be challenged. It's not wrong to challenge, Paul's clearly doing that. But there's a point at which a program of giving How do we do that in a way that honors God? Now, there's other ways of doing it. And in my background, classically, you didn't tell anybody your needs. You prayed and you trusted the Lord to bring in the funds. And so you never let a need be known. But Paul isn't reluctant to say there's a need in Jerusalem and I want us to do something about that. Um, so how do... How do how do we honor the biblical sense of giving? Obviously, in a local church like we're in at this particular time, and God is blessing us, and he's providing for us, and, and we can, uh, we're, we're not in a place where we're in a financial crunch. Where, um, but our principles ought to be formed not because of the pragmatic needs, <laughs> but because of the principles, if I'm saying. So think with me a little bit about how often... American business pragmatics and Paul's spiritual principles intersect with one another. Anybody have any? How they do or where they clash? Uh, if they, do, do they clash or uh, <laughs> where do they clash? How do they clash? Which is, how do we walk through these things? We know all kinds of ministries right now that are sending out letters with all kinds of appeals, and uh, um, and and those are real needs. So, Jordan, yeah. are you going to come and uh, do the microphone thing here, Richard? For the sake of you who are watching, no, it's just curious because we don't have apostles right now. So you have Paul, who's kind of bouncing between churches, and he knows what's going on in, in the larger Christian world at the time, because he's like a traveling missionary, and he's also an apostle, so he has unique authority and standing in the church, along with the other apostles. Um, sometimes this kind of model is used in defense of denominational, like Presbyterian church you know, hierarchy so that there's kind of oversight and then there can be this sharing and also, um, you know, doctrinal guards set in place, uh, um, that kind of thing. But so, you know, we, we have um, lots of independent churches and if one is in need, for, you know, you might not even know. Um, even if it's the church on the other side of the block. Because there's not, um, you know, you have Paul here as kind of a, uh, the intermediary, and he's saying, I know that sure. the church in Jerusalem needs some help. But he knew that secondhand, not by firsthand. Well, yeah, but he has, I mean, how do we um, have this kind of communication between churches so that needs can be met um, between congregations, between local churches, do, is there some way that it, you know, it's, how does it work today? I, I think you pointed out not very well. Well, within, within a denomination it can. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, 
a denomination, um, not in the sense of a shared, you know, shared uh, doctrinal statement, but a denomination in the sense of a hierarchy like the Presbyterian Church kind of denomination. They can do this kind of thing um, perhaps a little more efficiently than independent churches. Personally, I believe in independent churches as a Baptist, but so, you know, the question is then how does, how does this kind of thing play out? This giving was about a famine, right? Is that, I'm sorry? Do I understand right? This was about a famine. There was a, an issue, a, a need that they all would have known about, Well, I think, I think maybe part of it was famine, but I also think some of it was persecution. Okay, so, so this is well-known stuff. There's, it's not like a budget issue where they need help. This is, it seems to me like they would have been made aware of it based on the, the gravity of what they're dealing with. And we have that opportunity as well without a denominational link. Right, I don't know how many churches were hit by a fire or, or burnt down potentially here in, in California, but I don't know who they are or how, even if I wanted to give to one, I wouldn't send it to the address because it burnt down. Yeah, I just, I mean, just, there is a practicality of having somebody who, who has some sense of authority or trust be able to point somebody from hear and make a request there. But while you're making this request, if you use handwritten fonts, you'll increase your giving by you know, 5%. And if you use uh, an underline of blue, <laughs> you know, you'll bump it up another so many percent. And if you use a courier font, you know, that's been known to pull better, and if you use a live stamp, and all of these techniques are used in, you know, I don't know if they're used, I mean, they're used intentionally to get a better result for the effort, and I've always wrestled back and forth, is that good or bad, to, you know, it's a, it's a known technique, but I don't, I don't see Paul underlining in blue, so he'd get, you know, he, he appealed to higher, you know, he, he called them up to, uh, you know, imitate Christ's generosity, not, come on, come on, guys, you, you can do a little more, you know, he didn't have a little buzzer, you know, a little uh, thermometer that, you know, that hit, and, yeah, I mean, there's, what about these techniques? Are they... If you're going to write a letter, you might as well use it, or not. Well, I think a part of the challenge for me is Paul is very careful, if I'll, I'll use a term that I can't vindicate here, but he's very careful, it seems to me, to protect the spiritual, spirituality of their giving. That he's not using guilt, um, but there's a kind of... Oh, come on, you started here, finish. So um, he's not using uh, some method of coercion. He's not using um, enticement that if you give and plant your seed, you know, you'll get, you'll get back th this certain amount. Um, he's very careful to protect that. Uh, now, he knew his letter was going to be read. <laughs> That's probably the problem with a lot, that you, are they going to hear what I'm saying kind of thing, but I'm sorry. Well, I think some of it is your motivation in, you can have a word choice that um, presents a case well, or you can have something that is intentionally misleading about a need or not letting people know if it's been met, or you can craft something to be 
to induce guilt if you don't give a certain amount. But also with even some of the font stuff, if you want a book to be read, there are certain fonts that are easier to read or sizes. And so it, dep it can depend on your, your the, like the writer's or the presenter's heart, I think. Um, if they're trying to manipulate versus if you're trying to do a good job of explaining a need or an opportunity. There's a kind of interesting uh, line here. I grew up in a context where, uh, and I won't try to explain it, but it's helpful to, so we would only take a collection at the Lord's Supper service and that was a whole special service, and that was really for Christians only. In a public service, we would never take an offering. And that's when I went there and I began to serve as the first pastor they'd had in that context, and we began to grow. And those who came to the smaller service, the Lord's Supper, as we called it, were far fewer. And you had this large audience of believers and we would never take an offering there. And I can remember one summer going away and sitting in a service and listening and thinking, this is wrong, um, that we are not challenging Christians because a good number of them were Christians who were coming for the thing. That they think they can come and hear the message and never be challenged to support. And the Bible says it very clearly, let the one who's taught the word share in good things with those who are teaching the word. So that's a biblical principle. So sometimes on one hand, we, we have over-aggressiveness, <laughs> and other times we're underly teaching the expectations that Christians, if, I mean, Paul's whole point here is you've received grace, you've got, known God's generosity, and if it's got your heart, you'll be generous. You've, you've, you know, open heart, generosity, and all of that. So it's, it, it's a kind of challenge we have, we don't talk about money here, and there probably are times when that's not a good thing, that we need to challenge uh, people to up their game, uh, to, to think about what generosity means. Because we live in a consumer society, and a consumer society, it's about what am I getting for my buck? Um, but that's not a generous society that says, how do I, and that, that comes into what we're, we're next gonna go into. Sorry, I cut off somebody who was gonna say something, Richard, I think. Oh, David. On, the, on the other hand, there are those that would not share their need. I think of George Mueller and the ministry that he had and how the Lord provided for him in so many miraculous ways, touching hearts of people. And I'm not saying we, that there's that extreme that we go necessarily all the way that way, but sometimes we just have to give it to the Lord and the Lord will touch hearts and maybe someone will say, you know, the Lord impressed us upon me and they share that with a, another fellow member and it, trickles down to the church, perhaps, and then maybe more can be done. You know, uh, George Mueller had a marvelous ministry, and it was a significant ministry, um, and he was in the tradition out of which I came, so I know a lot about that tradition. But at the end of every year, he also wrote and published a record of how God had been faithful that previous year and how he'd met needs, which wasn't asking for funds, but it was certainly informing people about the needs and the opportunities and, and what had happened. So it wasn't just, and, and Hudson Taylor was the same way. There, um, even more recently, or, or OMF, sort of his organization, he was very influenced by Hudson Taylor. Um, and he, Hudson Taylor supported him for years when he was in China and did the same thing. So yeah, there are those who, who, who are, and I have, if, if that's the way the Lord leads you, then I think that that is, so that's clearly protecting the spirituality of, of giving in a significant way. But Paul's not afraid to say there's a need in Jerusalem. So I, I, anyway. Bruce. But my left hand isn't supposed to know what my right hand is doing. So how does all that fit in? Well, I think in that particular way, you know, what the Lord is talking about there is don't do your righteousness in public. I mean, that's in the synagogue. 
when you pray, go into a closet, go into, which doesn't mean never pray publicly, but don't do, don't only pray publicly. <laughs> um, but, and, and it's really picked up on Judaistic uh, practices of the time. When they gave, there was a way in which we know that there was a metal shaped container and those who were giving, because they'd given money, knew how to throw in the money to ring it around so that people would, they were sounding the gong, so everybody, and the Lord is saying, or pardon me, yeah, it's the Lord in that context saying, don't, don't be publicly showing. Obviously, there's no way you cannot let your right hand, it's one of the Lord's typical hyperboles, like pluck out your eye and so forth. But he's saying that to give for the sake of ostentation and promoting yourself. Um, but I don't think that that would necessarily rule out somebody giving a testimony how they'd given and God had blessed them in some particular way. But, uh, but there's other people who want to give and they want to control. Um, I'll give my money provided you do this and you put my name on this project and then we're into something entirely different. So... Okay, let's, we can come back as much as you want there. I, I'm, in, I, I'm wrestling with this, and even as I think about my own life and our own giving, this statement about Paul says that we want there to be equality. Now, it's not talking about wealth redistribution, although in the early church, they lived commonly at, at, at a certain point anyway. This is not coerced, there's nothing... It's this idea of we want you to give so there could be fairness. And I think in the way he's not saying equality, that it's across the board, but that there's a choosing to live at a lower need so that somebody might live at a subsistence need. And uh, as I wrestle with that, I realize it's very easy to think that when my income increases, my lifestyle should increase and rather than thinking, okay, what, what else do I do? And then I think, yeah, and he's applying this to people living in another country. So Christians in the United States who are more blessed than any other nation on earth financially, how does that affect us when we think of our brothers and sisters living in very difficult circumstances? And yet, so I'm, I'm, talk, I'm talking out loud. I'm doing my wrestling out loud. We know that money's corrupting. And I had people approach me in other countries as I've traveled and said, here's my card. Um, and I'd love to be connected to your church. Or if you can find me another church, I'm willing to be a member of any denomination if you would support me. You think, okay, um, this could be a real needy brother or it could be somebody who's looking for getting a living in a, in a particular way. And I've also been in Africa, um, and I'll still remember being in a church where the pastor was being supported. He'd gone to Dallas Seminary, he's being supported out of Texas. And in Texas terms, they would think, oh, this guy is living over there. He is uh, serving the Lord, let's support him. And they were supporting him at $40,000 a year, um, which nothing in Texas. I mean, I don't want to say, but you know, that's fairly. But in, in uh, this was in Ghana. In Ghana, that put you at the level of ambassadors for that country and cabinet ministers in the cabinet. And you thought, Oh, that's not the statement you want to make about people who you're supporting with the gospel, that they're able to. So the issue of how do we, how do we give, how do we support national workers because they need support, but yet at the same time, how not separate them or, it, it's a very challenging business. We were talking even the other day in elders uh, last night about ministry in Mexico and how do we, how do we wisely do that? How do we handle money? What does equality mean in that 
because it, it, it can't be registered in dollar amounts because there are cultures where people are living on $3 a day. Um, you understand what I'm wrestling with here? I'm trying to, what, what, what is God asking me to do? What is God asking us to do about equality as a principle in a world that's as complicated and complex as R is? And I've been very influenced by the book, When Helping Hurts, that you can throw money at certain things and you're doing more harm than good uh, in many cases or enriching a certain few. Help me wrestle with that. I, I need your help to figure that out. And I'll need your wisdom to... No, don't just stare at me. Help me. <laughs> is it possible that the equality here is also connected to us all being one in Christ? And to be sure that, that we're all without need, more than that we all have the same level of living. Yeah, I, I don't think it can mean that we all have the same level of living. That just, um, but I don't think it's just that we're all one in Christ because he, he's talking about here about real resources in some particular way. But he's not asking them to do it for all kinds of churches, just the ones in Jerusalem. And, and then we get into the practical questions about how you do this and how you would be involved in it. So um, I think much of the mental gymnastics sometimes cause us not to give. And I think a, a good rule of thumb is when in doubt, give. <laughs> Probably because we're not giving enough. Uh, I can speak for myself. Uh, even if it's a little, uh, the opening, you know, writing the check, sending the, you know, it, that practice, give a little, give a little bit more. It's a, you know, giving is a habit, and it needs to be, it, it is a habit that can be learned, it's also a habit that can be taught, and it's a habit that can, you know, as any skill, it can grow. And I think there are some people with the gift of giving, and that, that seems to be a, a spiritual gift of, of some sort, but the, we're called to, to be generous, and when when there is a, a clear, obvious need in front of you, if you just say, be well, um, be warm, be well, that there's a, there's a danger. Yeah, I, I, I understand and agree with what you're saying. I mean, in our own life, we started at a particular, not money amount, but percentage amount, and then have work to increase that as much as we can, a half percent or a percent a year, and, and move up at a particular level. So we're not just giving more actual dollars, but more percentage of what is coming. And that's been a good exercise for us. We're at a little bit different stage of life now. But the, uh, Anyway, it, it, it's just important for us, I think, to think about this, and we don't do it often enough in, in publicly and think, how do I carry out what Paul is saying here and grace others uh, as I become more generous and, uh, and giving? And it's easy, um, it's easy to give with the income tax deduction in mind rather than the what is honoring the Lord in all of this? And the, the income tax deduction is wonderful and ought to enable us to be more generous givers in that particular way. So I, I think uh, for us as a church, because at this side our missionary arm isn't very well developed. It's something that we have to give more thought for, to for out of our resources and out of the giving that's coming. How do we 
more effectively use those um, in, in a world that's full of, of real needs. And especially to think beyond our borders too, um, in terms of how we give and what we give. <clears throat>